Hello and welcome back to Obcast. Today we're going to talk about an approach to the differential diagnosis of postpartum fever and then focus on endometritis. I think it's important to realize that sepsis in the purpurium or the period of time following childbirth is still a leading cause of maternal mortality worldwide. Obviously, the developing world is overrepresented in those figures, but it's still very important for people practicing in Western countries. The most common cause is a genital tract infection, um, one of which is endometritis. But I think like everything in medicine, and particularly if this is an area that you're not as familiar with, it's important to have a structured and broad differential diagnosis. Now, postpartum fever, there's, you know, a lot of focus on endometritis and genital tract infections, but it's important to remember that venous thromboembolism, whether that be deep vein, even pelvic thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, can cause postpartum fever. Urinary tract infections are a common cause. Less commonly, but more so if a woman's had a caesarean section, might include pneumonia, or then surgical site infections. It's important to think about um, the, a caesarean section and the scar there, or an intra-abdominal collection, or in a woman who's had a spinal or an epidural anesthetic, a vertebral abscess is, is worth considering. Um, I would include in surgical site infections, any perineal repairs that have been done, they can also be a common site of infection and need to be examined. And then mastitis or breast abscess is another not uncommon cause of postpartum fever. If we talk about endometritis now, now this is a genital tract infection and it can happen with or without retained products of conception. In terms of the causative organisms, it's important to know that it can be either a mixture of organisms or it can just be one of numerous groups. So gram-positive uh, organisms such as Staphylococcus and Streptococcus are important. And it's particularly important to realize there's a very virulent strain of endometritis caused by group A strep. Gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli, Proteus, Enterobacter, and even anaerobic organisms such as Bacteroides, Peptostreptococcus, and Clostridium. When it comes to assessing these patients, the symptoms of endometritis are often lower abdominal pain, foul-smelling vaginal discharge, or an increase in bleeding when the bleeding had naturally been settling down. And in terms of on examination, they often have a fever and or hemodynamic changes that are consistent with fever, and they may have lower abdominal pain. I think this is a really useful time to do a, a speculum exam looking for and swabbing any discharge. And also the bimanual exam can be very helpful because these women often have a significant amount of uterine tenderness. And that can be very helpful in confirming the diagnosis. Now in terms of investigations, you know, it's common to do blood cultures, inflammatory markers, and, and they can be, I guess, somewhat helpful but shouldn't be relied upon. A pelvic ultrasound is is a is a useful investigation. Um, it it's uh, it can be tricky though in that women often have appearances which may be either consistent with blood clot or retained products of conception. But it's reasonably well accepted that um, if they do have retained products um, or a suspicion of in the setting of infection, that these women should undergo a a uh, suction evacuation. Now we'll just formalise the management now that. Being an infection, um, IV antibiotics, particularly in the unwell patient, um, are um, very important. And they really need to be broad spectrum, as we've discussed in the potential causative agents. So I'm going to pop a table at the bottom that looks at the different options. Supportive care for sepsis, what I mean by this is fluid resuscitation and or vasopressors and other organ support if patients are particularly unwell, but just be guided on that and involve other specialties as needed. And as mentioned, a suction evacuation uh, for retained products or a suspicion of retained products, given that diagnosis, can be a little bit tricky in the postpartum period. In terms of antibiotics, I've put a couple of different options here. I think, first of all, if we just talk about the oral options on the right-hand side. So if the woman has sort of minor symptoms and signs, then an Augmentin-type uh, oral antibiotic or a combination of Kefalexin and Metronidazole is helpful. In terms of IV antibiotics, then simple standard triple IV antibiotics, ampicillin, gentamicin, metronidazole would probably be the first line. 
Um, in the setting of penicillin allergy, a keftriaxone and metronidazole combo can be used. Uh, intravenous aug augmentin or amoxicillin clavulanate is available in a lot of countries and would be reasonable. And some other countries, um, such as North America, start with a clindamycin gentamicin combo. And if you think about the causative organisms, then all of these sort of antimicrobial options are, are very reasonable. So look, I just wanted to quickly touch on a broad differential to postpartum fever and talk a little bit more about the clinical features, assessment and then management of endometritis. I hope this has been helpful and thanks very much for listening.